Hello and welcome to this edition of a page from history. I am Nilanjan Mukhopadhyay. Very recently, Russia hosted a galaxy of international leaders, including the Indian President, Mr. Pranab Mukherjee. They gathered on Moscow's iconic Red Square to celebrate the 70th anniversary of Victory Day. This day marks one of the final watersheds of the most widespread war in history, which involved more than 100 million people and from over 30 countries. The Second World War changed the world dramatically, set up different power blocks, dismantled old republics, and most importantly, ushered the end of colonialism. The Second World War also introduced weapons of mass destruction on a scale not seen before that. Yet, the world marks this day with a massive display of arms and ammunition. Though India was not independent, the people of the country played an important role in the Second World War. When the war began, there were fewer than 2 lakh Indians in the Indian Army under British control. But the number swelled to more than 25 lakhs when the war ended. Yet India was just a marginal participant. I am joined by a highly distinguished panel of experts to discuss some of the most important aspects of the Second World War. My first guest on this program is Mr. Rajiv Sikri, a very noted uh, former diplomat of India who served at various important Indian missions in Europe at very critical points in history. Professor Balveer Arora, a very eminent political scientist, retired from the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Finally, I have with me a very accomplished historian, Indivar Kamptekar, Professor of History at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, Mr. Sikri, let me begin off this discussion with you. Victory Day 2015, for the first time, the Western nations stay away from it. Not exactly a boycott, though that word can possibly be used by some of the mm. journalists who want to sell uh, a copy rather well. But yes, they decide to stay away. And more importantly, the Chinese troops were there on Red Square. Something different about how to look at the legacy of the Second World War? Well, uh, you know, uh, it is uh, widely believed and rightly, I, I think, that the uh, post-Second World War order yeah. ended in 1989, although that was the beginning of the end. I think today, in 2015, right. Uh, we are seeing 1989 when you talk about are you referring to and the fall of the, the Berlin fall of the Berlin Wall, Wall, Wall and the beginning of the the, the dismantling of the Soviet Union absolutely yeah. uh, that was the beginning yes. and I think in 2015 uh, it's uh, kind of uh, collapsed because the issues today are so different hmm. from those that were in 1945 when the world war ended right. and there was this coalition of uh, victorious powers. Hmm who then went on to form the permanent members of the Security Council. There was a belief in creating a new world order, mm. uh, 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 which was the, going to be the war to end all wars. All that uh, carried on for a while, right? but now it is three generations away. And, and I think that what has happened is that uh, Europe uh, is, uh, is, is got united mm -hmm. thanks to the Second World War. Right. Now it's cracking up again. Mm -hmm. And uh, what the West, particularly the Americans, have done is to take the fight into the uh, Russian backyard by mm -hmm. over Ukraine. Right. And uh, that is a very fundamental uh, red line, a Lakshman Rekha, which I think the West has crossed. Uh, Putin has reacted violently. Mm -hmm. and. Now there is this uh, standoff, okay. uh, which uh, I don't know how it's going to end. We had a recent right. meeting of Kerry in Sochi with yeah. the Russian leaders. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the West is, uh, is no longer prepared to treat Russia as right. an equal. Right. Some very interesting points, Professor Arora, uh, what has been made by Mr. Rajiv Sikri. One is that he's talking about the Lakshman Rekha, which he feels that the Western countries have probably crossed. Uh, there is a kind of a standoff, and we're talking about a probable standoff building up to discuss 
standoff way back in history, a very violent standoff which had such huge losses of property as well as human life. To begin with, you know, how do we look at 70 years after this is also the 70th year when a series of events took place, but Victory Day, one of the most important of the war, ended in Europe. It continued in other parts of the world thereafter also for several months till, of course, the Hiroshima Nagasaki, uh, you know, nuclear attacks. But how do you look at uh, the significance of this day and uh, how do you look at, uh, you know, the basic change of equations as what has been talked about by Mr. Sikri? Yes, I think, you know, what, what we are seeing today <coughs> is the uh, way in which the, um, the kind of world order that was being built up after the Second World War, uh, the rapidity with which Europe got back on its feet, thanks to the Marshall Plan, uh, where they insisted on uh, free markets, and then the Iron Curtain, the Cold War, the uh, treaties that were uh, put together, NATO and uh, the Warsaw Pact, it seemed that there had been uh, for some time a, uh, a new equilibrium, hmm. even though it was uh, very tense, it was uh, the threat of nuclear uh, war. And as Ambassador Sikri said, all that changed in 89. 89 is, is a remarkable. And then right. we are now... Remarkable year. Remarkable year. And then we are now seeing a, a different unfolding where new alliances... A reworking uh, of, rejigging of world uh, coalitions of different equations. Exactly. That, uh, you know, the, now the, the, the idea that uh, um, if, if Europe is to hold together, because that cement is no longer there, uh, America has uh, moved uh, its interest away towards Asia. It's, it's much more concerned uh, with uh, how uh, the future uh, unfolds uh, in Asia. And these new uh, groupings, BRICS, for example, now the, the China, Russia, the presence of China, which was not at all involved uh, in the victory in the Second World War, the presence of China in right, the uh, in Red Square part. is, a, is a, a very symbolic gesture that, you know, if, if others have gone, um, uh, there is a new uh, uh, solidarity which is emerging. Right. Indivar Kamtekar, you know, while, uh, you know, preparing to come and, you know, host this particular show with eminent academics like you, uh, reading up about what had happened in Russia, what was happening, is that there is so much of uh, the lack of history in the current celebrations which was there in Moscow during this entire period. Uh, as a historian, how do you look at the 70th anniversary of the war, something which is caught in today's uh, equations as has been discussed by the co-panelists, or would you still look at the historical significance first? Well, I would look at the historical significance, mm -hmm. but the point I'd like to make is that the World War is not just something about Russia. Right. It's about us. And we need to think much more than we actually do right. about how the society which we live in mm -hmm. is a product of World War II. Right. So one can say that relevance changes with 1989. Right. Uh, that's certainly true if you look at the way the Europeans respond uh, to the world war. I would say that from an Indian viewpoint, hmm. the dates would be slightly different because in our society, it is World War II which establishes what we know as the license right. permit Raj. Right. And for us, the dismantling of that dates to 1991. So the structures which we see, which are normally attributed to uh, Nehruvian socialism mm. were actually set in place in World War II and those continued whether you're looking at things like rationing systems, PDS, or whether you're looking at uh, forex control, all these things which last till 1991. Mm -hmm. These are children of World War II. As far as so India is concerned. As far as, it's, as far as we are concerned. Mm. And I think we need to, you know, in our society, the story of World War II is swallowed by that of independence. Mm. We need to rescue it as an independent story. Right. We also need to understand that something which I intend doing a bit later in the program as to how different nationalist leaders coming from different schools, different ideologies, different outlooks, how they looked at uh, the, the war, whether they looked at uh, whether the Second World War was an Indian war also or not.
Uh, Ambassador Sikri, moving on back to you, uh, when we talk about uh, how Russia celebrated Victory Day in 2015, now quite significantly, uh, the German Chancellor visited uh, mm. Russia, but not on the 9th of May, but a day later. Mm. Now, after having spent a considerable time in that particular region, also being posted there at a time when you were talking about 19, when this entire region was breaking up, you know, going through complete. How would Germany, which was at the other end, at the unfortunate end of the Second World War, if I can use the word unfortunate end, how would they be looking at uh, a fairly significant watershed of uh, the Second World War, uh, probably the last uh, uh, watershed anniversary of the Second World War coming to an end, which uh, has few of the survivors of who actually saw those years? That's a very interesting How would they question. Be at it? Because I have always believed that uh, after the Second World War, right. the Germans uh, are the only Europeans who really understood the Russians. Mm -hmm. And they, I say that because in their hearts, the Germans know that had it not been for the Russians, they would have conquered Europe. Right. The real battles were not those in Normandy or uh, on the Western Front. The right. real battles were Kursk, Stalingrad, right. Leningrad. Those were the battles which sapped the energy of the Germans. Yes. And so the Germans have learned to respect Russia. Mm -hmm. That respect comes out in the decision, even today when Angela Merkel is not very happy with Putin, to say, no, but this is something that we... Secondly, the Germans know that were it not for Gorbachev and his policies, there would be no united Germany. Right. There could have been a bloodbath in 1989. The fact that Germany was peacefully reunited mm -hmm. is thanks to Russia, the Soviet Union. Right. So, so that, to that extent, the, the fact that Germany has been able to reunite, to prosper, right. and in their hearts, as I said, they understand uh, Russia. So you'll always find the Germans are much more sympathetic and understanding of the Russians than any so, other. So I think, you know, what you're saying that much more sympathetic and understanding is possibly the reason as to why Angela Merkel was there in Russia, but maybe not on the particular day. Yet, also, but that, or that day also it's not yes. just that. The Germans have learned not to underestimate Russia. Right. Because Russia is a neighbor, and any wrong mistake, wrong judgment on their part can prove to be very costly. Right. And that's a very interesting point. We'll carry it forward when we come back after a short little break, which I have to take at this particular point. To what extent was the Second World War a continuation of unresolved disputes of the First World War? The world in the 1930s was still recovering from the effects of the first global conflict. Yet another war was heaped on humankind. Did it in any way resolve any of the issues? Stay with us. This program will continue. Welcome back to Page from History. We are talking about the Second World War, its many causes and implications. Professor Arora, before we went in for a break, Mr. Uh, Rajiv Sikri was talking about the Germans getting to learn, or rather, you know, respecting Russians for what uh, really happened in the Second World War. A very pointed point which he made was that had it not been for the Russians, the history of the Second World War would have been completely different. It would have possibly have a completely different outcome. In fact, if you look at some of the figures, you find you know that that among the, the countries which suffered maximum losses, Soviet Union was among the people who lost the maximum in terms of both people as well as in terms of resources. When we talk about uh, the world today and as to how does today's world go back and look at the Second World War, what do you think are from your academic tool, what are the most basic elements which you want to pick up and look at? Well, I think uh, uh, the, the sacrifice that Russia made uh, uh, in the Second World War is something that is stupendous. Right. Uh, that was uh, that, uh, and the fact that they celebrate it uh, with such uh, seriousness and, and, and such, uh, of course, the, the display today has also a different meaning because um, Russia has been going through a phase where uh, it has been uh, tossed around a little, uh, in figuratively speaking, treated lightly. And but uh, a lot of people do definitely point out that it is really ironic that something which is supposed to 
mark the end of a war is actually celebrated by a huge uh, display of military might. A signal that, uh, that we are still Russia is for any, still uh, yes is that Russia is still a power mm -hmm. that it may have suffered during this period uh, due to uh, the uh, economic conjunctures. It has not come out that well, but it cannot mm -hmm. be ignored in any future um, thinking on how the world has to be balanced. Right. And and the fact that China is there uh, adds to the the uh, moment. Uh, uh, the seriousness with which uh, it has to be considered. I think if we are flipping through the pages of history, it would be useful to go back to the 50s, the immediate right. post-war period. Right. And there are legacies from that which uh, have uh, continued. One, of course, is the, the, the fact, of course, this is the baby boomer generation, which is uh, now uh, uh, has been in power for some time. But the fact that uh, Europe uh, put itself together uh, so rapidly, and if you see the forces at work uh, during that period, for initially there was this temptation to capitalize on uh, Germany's defeat, mm. and the, 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 the crux of the dispute was the roar, the steel, and the coal um, right. that uh, uh, was the prize. And so you had the first Monet plan, which uh, uh, sought to uh, keep a stranglehold on that. Luckily, uh, better sense prevailed. And while today, the, while we are celebrating the end of World War II, the very next day, hmm. 9th May, is also Europe Day. Right. Uh, Robert Schuman's uh, right. famous uh, declaration. And you do hear voices today um, uh, in Europe, in, in, in France, uh, saying that instead of celebrating the victory over Germany, right. we should be celebrating now the birth of the European Union. Right. As Ambassador Sikri says, the European Union itself uh, is developing some question marks, particularly in after fact, the British almost, elections. In fact, whenever we go back and look at uh, the Second World War and you know look at the various watersheds, it was a fairly long period of long war. Be besides, you know, from 1939 to 1945, but besides, it's also a certain period, you know, which kind of played into uh, the build-up of the war, the build-up years. Every nation would be looking at each of those watersheds from their own perspective, putting them in the central, uh, you know, as a central issue within the entire framework. Indivar Kamtekar, uh, you know, coming back to uh, 2015 and... Uh, how different nations looked at it. Within the Indian context, there was also, because I'm coming back to you because you said that you flagged that we have to look at it from our perspective also. There was considerable debate about the extent to which India should participate in a watershed celebration for the Second World War in Russia. Yeah, <laughs> we have as a country a problem with right. World War celebrations. Right. Because we've had it with the First World War also. Absolutely, we've had it. And uh, it's actually a case where the army as an institution, the institutions would want to celebrate it. Right. Uh, but the nation or the political leadership over the years would have said that this is an imperialist war and right. therefore not something in which we were highly invested. Right. But you know, there is an irony here which is not often talked about, which is that in a way, the World War showed up some of the weaknesses of nationalism in India hmm. because the Congress was very clear that India should not participate right. and therefore that Indians should not join the army as soldiers, right. uh, money should not be contributed, right. industrialists should not supply, but many people in India hmm. were not willing to forego the job opportunities right. or the business profits. Which were quite often it is said that the Crips mission was sent in India as a package to peace the Congress leaders. Well, the Crips mission, there is a debate about it, mm. but uh, uh, it was sent when, at a time when the British were panicky because it looked as if Japan was about to right. invade. Uh, and there was a feeling that just as Singapore had fallen, Calcutta might also, might also. Uh, might also fall. Uh, so, so there is uh, there is that <coughs> context to the Crips mission, uh, to the Crips mission also, but if one is looking at this, 
in international perspective, then one has to remember that in India we lost about 30 to 40,000 soldiers. Right. The British lost about 4 lakhs of that order. And of course, the Germans and the Russians lost in the millions. So these are very different impacts. Right. Uh, Professor Arora, coming back to you when we talk about India and the Second World War, uh, yes, we do actually need to also talk about as to how the national movement, how did it react to the Second World War, also because of this huge uh, debate which has been there for a long period of time, including which surfaced once again over Subhash Chandra Bose and uh, his stance during the Second World War, siding up, aligning with uh, the Japanese and uh, the Axis powers in order to fight uh, what he felt was uh, a legitimate independence war. Yes, I think uh, the, the idea that uh, the, the primary goal was independence and that uh, of uh, throwing out the British mm -hmm. colonial power. Uh, Subhash Chand Bose, uh, Netaji, of course, took that as the only key uh, objective worth uh, pursuing and, right. and he rejected all the other arguments uh, um, uh, which were uh, being uh, put forward uh, in the mainstream mm -hmm. Congress. Uh, but uh, I think the, the, while it was a technicality that the, the India was not, because we already had, uh, as a result of the 1935 Act, uh, governments functioning. Right. And uh, so the fact that uh, there was no consultation and that uh, 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 Suomoto um, uh, ex party. And it was they, also uh, not a very representative government. Not a, but the fact that India was declared to be at war without so much as um, uh, by your leave, yeah, the, uh, that uh, no, we are, we are going to war and what do you think? Uh, there right. was no such thing. So I think there were principles involved in that. But all said and done, uh, while they, these are differences, I think leaving aside the institution of the army, which, which has its own traditions and its own uh, uh, values, I think um, uh, the fact that Indians fought and died, right. and when they died on the battlefield, I even that first war, be, that needs to be recognized and yeah. be remembered yeah. they and talked about. May have been serving a colonial uh, power, right. but when they sent their letters, when they were miserable, they were thinking of India. They were not thinking of Britain. Right. They, they, they remained Indians, and so to that extent, I think we need to remember. And and I think some of the remarkable documentation has also been put together by various agencies as well as specialized uh, bodies which have worked at as to how the centenary of the First World War and Indian participation in that. That has been one of the largely unknown uh, chapters. Ambassador Sikri, moving back to you, you know, this entire uh, Germany and Russia, you know, which you kind of talked about. Now, very few people today would actually, barring academics and people who have been engaged professionally with uh, the subject that we're talking about, would actually remember that though th Russia and Germany ended up on completely two different sides at the end of the war when it began, it, they started with a per virtual pact. So if one actually goes back and tries to understand that what went wrong between Germany and Russia. Uh, first, I just want to add yes, something sure, to what uh, my co-panelists have yes. said. I think one of the things that we should appreciate in India is mm -hmm. that without the Second World War, mm -hmm. our independence may not have come out about that easily. Right. It was a it weakened, there would have been a bigger struggle. Yes, it was a weakened a Britain one. which could not hold on to its right. empire. Right. So we have to recognize right. that the World War brought us in some way. Of course, there was our freedom movement and our leaders and so forth. But a weakened, a, a weakened Britain was the critical the factor. Process, yeah. What went wrong between Germany and Russia? I think it was uh, uh, German ambition. Right. They had signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Pact mm -hmm. uh, to keep the Russian front uh, quiet right. while uh, Germany tackled uh, Britain and France. Britain and France, mm -hmm. which just goes to show that the Germans understood that they needed that front. They to needed be quiet. one front. To be uh, but then after quiet, they, but they yeah. made the mistake of actually possibly opening two fronts. Two fronts. And they underestimated that Russia uh, had huge depth. Right. I mean, during the Second World War, the Russian uh, retreated to Siberia, right. to Central Asia, and then let the winter take right. over. Right. 
Like so, was, uh, so there, there was, was these account of one of the German, uh, you know, generals talking about the Russians just came wave after wave, you know, when they, when they started trying and, to go and, and the capacity yes. of the Russians to bear pain and suffering. I mean, I have spent many years yes, in, yes. in Russia and the Soviet Union, and I have come across a lot of people on my first posting by the second, by yes. the 70s. Yes. And the people said, you know, what was first the war, what was the war like? And they said, well, we had no shoes, so we, what did we do? We just wrapped Pravda on our feet and we trudged yeah. through the snow. And even you know, after that the war, virtually, virtually everybody knew somebody or the other who had uh, Absolutely. You know, died in the war. You know, Absolutely. The, the number of casualties. Which so is so that personal. element of the Russian character yes. was underestimated right. by the Germans. Right. And that was possibly one of the biggest blunders which the Germans make. We'll take another break at this point and then come back and resume this conversation. At the end of his visit to Russia, the President Pranab Mukherjee said that the 70th anniversary celebrations of Victory Day were an occasion to recall the sacrifices of Indian soldiers. Yet, as we have been discussing, there was intense political debate on India's role in the war. Stay tuned in. This program will continue.